So we're down here in South Florida, in Biscayne Bay, and we're heading out for a very exciting day on the water. Getting to dive and explore one of the major threats that face coral reefs, not just here in South Florida, but all over the world. The Earth is a water planet. More living creatures live beneath the waves than in our world above them. But our actions above the surface are endangering the rich ecosystems below, from dead zones to acidic oceans and rising seas to vanishing aquifers. These issues threaten the very existence of life on Earth. We are embarking on a series of expeditions around the world to explore these issues, uncover the science behind what causes them, and work together to find solutions. Today I'm heading out on Biscayne Bay to understand how water quality, salinity, and ocean pH are threatening the health of Florida's coral reefs. Hi. Look at that. Oh. It's the Ilsa. Thank you. I am. Yes. Yeah, nice to on. meet you. Come on. Come aboard. I'm delighted. <laughs> We're super excited. Ilsa yeah, Kuffner is a research water. marine biologist with the United States Geological Survey, studying the causes and effects of coral reef degradation. Today, She's taking me to one of her research sites. Where are we headed out today? We are heading out to a site where I've been monitoring coral growth. It's at a, a historic lighthouse called Fowey Rocks Light. Ilsa's growing corals at several locations throughout the Florida Keys to learn how pollution and water quality impacts coral growth. 25.5904. Right our site's pretty much over there. It should be a little further away from the light than... Uh, okay. Run it down! By returning to the same research sites time after time, Ilsa can measure the impacts that changes in water chemistry have on her test corals. There are 10 cinder blocks about this big that are sitting on the bottom and have corals transplanted. Although coral reefs cover just 1% of the ocean, healthy corals are vital nurseries for fish and protect coastlines from storms. Corals do a lot of things for us that uh, we should appreciate. One, it protects shorelines from the impacts of waves and hurricanes. Through the natural process of breaking down, uh, the reef actually provides sand for beaches. They also provide an exceptional habitat for all kinds of other living things in the ocean. So, Ilsa, tell me about some of the threats that are facing coral reefs and causing them to decline so much. Things have not been very good for corals in the last 30 or 40 years. We've seen a lot of coral reef degradation or dying off of live corals. There's three main reasons. Uh, number one would be coral bleaching, which happens because the water gets too warm in the late summer. We've had an extremely hot August. Um, the water temperature was above 86 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's really stressful for coral. And so I really need to check my corals to see if they're still surviving right now or if they might be dying. Once we get underwater, we find ourselves surrounded by moon jellyfish. Dense jellyfish swarms like these are indicators that something is not quite right in these waters, most likely the result of rising temperatures and changing ocean chemistry. But to measure the impact changing water quality has on coral reef growth, we need to swim to the experimental cinder blocks where Ilsa has anchored her test corals. For the last five years, each of these cinder blocks has been home to a transplanted coral. By studying how these corals are growing, Ilsa and her USGS team hope to better understand how to protect coral reef ecosystems. Sensors on the blocks record water quality data like salinity and temperature. This data is key to understanding the complex factors that threaten coral reefs, shallow water, runoff, air pollution, and other factors can work together to cause significant changes in water quality. The colorful appearance of the massive starlet coral on this cinder block indicates it's healthy and doing okay. But just a few feet away, wild species don't seem to be holding up. 
This one is completely bleached. Only its hard white skeleton is peeking out from the ocean floor. The coral over here also shows signs of stress thanks to a process called coral bleaching. When corals are stressed by changes in conditions such as rising water temperatures, they expel the symbiotic algae living in their tissues, causing them to turn completely white. When a coral bleaches, it's not necessarily dead. They can withstand temporary bleaching, but are under severe stress and susceptible to disease. Corals can get sick just like you and me. They get bacterial infections and viruses, and if they can't recover their symbiotic algae, eventually they will die. All right. All right. What a terrific dive. You good? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks. Yeah, that was uh, much better than I expected. There was, yeah? There was some coral bleaching. So some good news then. Yeah, yeah, the, the corals on my blocks, the ones in the experiment, mm -hmm. are, are surviving and they look really healthy actually. They did so, look nice, some nice color to them. Yeah. I did notice uh, there were a lot of corals around mm -hmm. the site that are bleaching though. Yeah, the, the more sensitive species were, were bleaching, like the lettuce corals and the fire coral. So um, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't as bad as I expected. Well, that's the good news then. Back on board the boat, Ilsa shows me evidence of another problem corals are up against. Corals build their skeletons out of calcium carbonate through a process called calcification. What they do is a, a process called calcification, meaning the creation of rock or calcium carbonate, um, which is really the same substance that chalk is made out of. Um, and they, they pull what they need out of the water column and or out of the ocean. Mm -hmm. The denser a skeleton is, the more robust it is. The and healthier the, the coral is. Um, so is it like humans? You know, you want to have nice thick bones? Exactly, so you don't break easily. Corals need two things to grow their skeletons, calcium ions and carbonate ions. While calcium ions are in plentiful supply, carbonate ions are declining because over time, the ocean has been getting more acidic. Why? Well. The ocean naturally absorbs CO2 from the atmosphere, and when CO2 dissolves in water, it becomes more acidic. However, since the start of the Industrial Revolution, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere has increased thanks to humans burning fossil fuels like oil and coal. In response, the ocean has absorbed about 40% of that extra CO2. Unfortunately, the increased carbon dioxide levels in the ocean are disrupting the natural balance by lowering the pH and making the oceans more acidic, a reaction called ocean acidification. The more acidic the ocean becomes, the harder it gets for coral to build their skeletons, which threatens their very survival. That CO2 yes. we're pumping into the air is, is ending up in the ocean and that's causing it to become more acidic and that's putting stress on the corals. Yes. That's pretty scary. Now it's not just corals though that this is affecting. Yes, any, any anything. any creature that creates a shell. Scientists have only recently begun to monitor the impacts of declining pH on marine organisms. But scientists and policymakers both recognize that ocean acidification is increasing. So steps to mitigate or adapt to these changes is essential. We can control pollution along the coast. We can control overfishing. We can yeah. control those kinds of things directly and immediately. Mm -hmm. And so being able to have corals be as healthy as possible, yes. they have a better chance to survive these kinds of bigger global ocean changes that are happening. But if we're dumping waste and trash and sewage and pollution on top of them, then, then, they, uh, then they have a slim chance to survive. Mm -hmm. So there's always hope, there's always something we can do. Yes. Yeah.